Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the post T session. Uh, the name of the session is Update Session on Equipment, and it's a pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Sada once again, this time as a wise counsel, and Dr. Ajay Arora and uh, Dr. Sriram Gopal. Dr. Khare is here, and Dr. Unni Krishnan to please join us on the dais. And I would request uh, our first speaker the, for the keynote uh, talk by Dr. Rajan Narayanan, and he'll be talking on new toys for the future other than OCT oblique vitrectomy machines. Thanks to the VRSI Scientific Committee for giving me the opportunity to talk about new toys for the future. In fact, uh, when I started making the presentation, it was uh, over 100 slides, and I had to cut it down and cut it down and cut it down. Ultimately, when I saw it said, uh, except OCT and uh, detect me, then I realized I would remove all the diagnostic and surgical, and then just stay on with drugs, cell therapy, and gene therapy. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, these are some of the drugs which I have listed, but I'll be elaborating on them. Randibizumab, we all know, uh, was probably the first major anti-VEGF uh, which has survived over time. Accugen was, in fact, the first one, but came out of use but the biggest challenge for all retina specialists is the durability uh, of these injections we still have to give a lot of injections to our patients to maintain their outcome and that challenge can be overcome by different ways and one of the ways is uh, having a sustained release implant <clears throat> or a delivery system so this port delivery system uh, needs to be implanted once in those patients who actually have shown a response to prior Vicentis or Centrix or Ranibizumab regular injections, but once they have shown a response, that means you can use these implants in these patients. It's a surgical procedure, a brief one, but um, once you refill them, at least for six months, you don't have to refill them. Um, so this uh, Ranibizumab, which is injected or in the reservoir, is not the usual concentration which we have for Lucentis or eccentrics. It's 100 milligram per ml instead of the 10 milligram per ml, but it works on the simple principle that diffusion concentration of Fick's law, higher the concentration in the, in the implant and lower the concentration in the vitreous, you're going to have diffusion into the vitreous. And the archway trial was the pivotal phase three trial for macular degeneration patients. Uh, here you can see the blue line was the one who patients were who received the regular intravitreal ranibizumab injections, and you can see the two lines hugging each other. Uh, there's no difference between the PDS implanted patients and the regular intravitreal injection, except for the first uh, month where after the surgery, some patients have vitreous hemorrhage or can have some inflammation, there's a mild dip, but after that, it's pretty much uh, stable and Many of these patients did not have to have another injection, those who had PDS. But just as a caveat, recently this has been voluntarily withdrawn by Genentech in the US uh, for reasons of dislocation of a specific part of the implant. But hopefully they would come back to manufacturing issue probably. But there's another important uh, concern which all retina specialists must be aware of is the higher risk of endophthalmitis, while here it says 1.6% uh, compared to 0.6% for monthly ranibizumab. I think it's still high for the monthly ranibizumab, but if you see overall anywhere above three times the risk of endophthalmitis. So if there have to be guidelines on, in fact, when to remove the implant because you know, we know that the disease process for ARMD or DME, it dies down a little bit after a few years. So 
having an implant for five or ten years only increases the risk and probably doesn't have too much of a benefit. The next molecule I would like to bring to your attention is ferrisimab. Uh, we all have known about uh, anti VEGF and all the drugs so far which we have used has been against only one particular target of VEGF, that is VEGF A. But this molecule of ferrisimab is bispecific, it, it can uh, negate both VEGF A as well as NG2 or angiopoidin 2. Um, and this was approved for both uh, AMD and DMA, and it's going to be available in India next year. In fact, uh, Roche will be submitting their application next month to our regulator DCGI and they are hopeful to get it by the second quarter uh, for us in India. The pivotal trials, uh, Yosemite and Ryan for DME as well as Tenai and Lucerne for AMD showed that uh, compared to uh, Eflibercept two eight weeks, the uh, the lines, as you can see, in terms of the primary outcome, the gain in vision, were pretty similar uh, for the different dosing regimens of perisimab of uh, Q8 and and the personalized treatment regimen, which could extend up to 16 weeks. So imagine patients uh, not having to have an injection for a, for four months at a stretch. So that is the biggest advantage uh, with perisimab, and the newer molecules probably would be held up to this higher standard of less frequent injections. Uh, and in this pie chart, you can see both in Yosemite and Ryan, uh, the number of patients who could be maintained at 216 weeks or four monthly injections was 60% uh, or more. And this was the uh, AMD study, which I mentioned about Tenai and Yusan also had uh, similar results compared with uh, Eflibercept 8 weeks. In terms of uh, cell therapy or cell replacement therapy, something which is very exciting right now, a lot of uh, companies are involved, a lot of universities and academics are involved in this. Uh, for both uh, the inherited retinal dystrophies as well as for acquired retinal diseases like dry AMD. So people are looking at both uh, embryonic stem cells as well as pluripotent stem cells to regenerate different kinds of uh, cells, either the RP or the photoreceptors. And uh, what, what is interesting is, as I said, it's not just for inherited retinal diseases, it's even for acquired retinal diseases also, uh, especially the dry AMD, uh, which is, uh, and this, this table lists so many trials. In fact, I'm, I'm sure there are many more which are not listed in this table currently, but from India, I stem, uh, Dr. Rajni Bhattu, I don't know if she's here in this audience, but she's here in the conference. She's also leading a large trial uh, of uh, stem cells for uh, dry AMD. They are in touch with both the US FDA and uh, DCGI, and they hope to start enrolling the first patient in January next year. A few more um, therapies. There is a molecule, OPT302, is looking at inhibition of VEGF C and D. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, so far only VEGF A has been targeted, but if we could somehow target VEGF C and D in combination with VEGF A, um, we could probably increase the durability of action of uh, the drugs. And we also have a new drug being looked at in early clinical trials, that is the uh, plasma calicrine inhibitor, for both DME and AMD actually. Um, and uh, they are being looked at potential, uh, not just standalone treatment, but in combination with anti -VEGF. We also have the, the gene therapy treatments. Again, gene therapy, as we all know, Luxterna for uh, LCA RP65 biallelic mutation. We also have other forms of gene therapy treatment for various other retinal diseases. And here it's for AMD and DR, as might be surprising that you know, a lot of treatments are happening not just for the inherited retinal diseases in this field, but also for the acquired retinal diseases. And one new technology, which is the optogenetics technology, where it's, it's mutation agnostic, that means irrespective of mutation, irrespective of the 
phenotype of disease. It, it, it transforms the neurobiology and uses the optical technology and genetic engineering, meaning it, the other cells other than photoreceptors can also be transformed into a light activated uh, neural signal cell. And uh, you can use, if, if the photoreceptors are damaged, you can transform either the bipolar cell or even the inner retinal layers, including glial cells, to become uh, like photoreceptors. Um, I think I had eight minutes. Uh, yeah. So optogenetics, and this is, I'm just going to conclude in a couple of slides. Uh, so this is how it works. You still need to have a special gadget. Uh, it's not just simple injection. We we'll start seeing it. it's a different kind of field that the patients will have. But compared to a regular gene therapy, which we know for uh, as, as Luxterna for um, LCA, optogenetics, as I said, it, it, you can transform in any any condition, any disease. It's not specific to LCA or RP or star guard. And uh, it, it, it has uh, its own limitations, but uh, you know it can be a transformation for patients who don't have any other treatment at this point of time. So in conclusion, uh, the past, or at least the recent past, has been frequent intravitreal injection, and mainly anti-VEGF. We hardly have any choice. We keep discussing different protocols, but we don't have anything specific. But the current transition is a very important trans transition that is happening right now. Some of us uh, may not be aware of this, but yeah, longer acting agents are coming up and also gene therapy, cell therapy studies are going on that they're like knocking at the door right now. Uh, so uh, promising treatment for newer disease coming up. But what's, what's there for us as retina specialists? Are we just going to be injecting? Um, is that the only skill that we'll still be requiring? Or is it something else? Because there is going to be a shift to uh, individualized treatments patient specific. You need to understand the pathology, pathophysiology, and genetics before we can use any of these drugs as a, as a you know, uh, common treatment for all of them. One choice may not fit all. So thank you all very much. And I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, fellows, and also Arshad from uh, Nevada. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Narayanan, for bringing out the recent developments and the things which are coming up. I had a question for you that with these newer drugs that we have in complex molecules, and we are seeing some complex the post marketing surveillance, do you think that that is becoming a very important part of that we have to look into this new technology, adapt it, but then later on we come to complications which we might have? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a very important question that you have asked, and we have experienced this issue with various drugs, not just in ophthalmology, beyond ophthalmology, some have had to be recalled or withdrawn. Um, and, and we know that any trial will have a limited sample size and very strict inclusion exclusion criteria. So once you start increasing the number of patients that you are using in, uh, the small event rates, which may not have had statistical significance, uh, start blowing up. We know about brolicizumab. Uh, and also uh, we have patients sometimes who may not strictly follow the criteria which were included in the trials who may be more susceptible to these uh, problems. And obviously the endophthalmitis which I talked about for PDS, uh, the longer you follow, because an implant sitting in the sclera for a longer time, there is going to be some leakage probably and uh, risk of higher risk of endophthalmitis. So, uh, but I, I would like to have add a caveat here. I presented these, I don't have any either first hand use experience or a trial experience. So uh, maybe whilst you can add uh, more on this. Okay, Sada. Okay, I, I, yeah, so uh, we, we do have access to the PDS as well as uh, for it map now, we've been using them for a while. PDS, of course, as you pointed out, is off the market right now because of the septal dislocation problems. Um, Frisimab, well, we've been using a fair amount um, and have been uh, impressed by. Uh, overall, my, my experience so far is that you don't get as potent a drying effect compared to brolicizumab, but clearly seems to be better than clivercep. That's in sort of all comers. Obviously, individual patients, there's going to be uh, variation. And so right now, I was going to ask you this question, uh, which, which, was, uh, which, which we're still struggling with, is how is this all going to shake out in terms of what agent are we going to start with? How are you going to choose the escalation? Uh, you know, I, I feel like um, that uh, that's going to be the brave new world. That's what that's going to be the interesting challenge for all of us 
the next couple of years. So here in India, you have a long-standing experience with uh, ranibizumab biosimilars, but uh, we finally have two of them now in the U.S. market. Still unclear exactly how how all of these are going to be used. We may actually have a, an originator bevacizumab soon uh, that's going to get approved as well. I mean, an FDA cleared bevacizumab. So, so it's going to be very complicated in making these choices. I don't have an answer. I wanted to see if you had an answer. Oh no, I definitely don't have an answer. But I I, I always have uh, wondered how we discuss as ophthalmologists, retina specialists. Uh, even today morning, we had a nice interaction on anti-VEGF sessions. Uh, but we, while the molecules themselves are like follow up on oncology molecules, but I still like the way the oncologists follow a fixed protocol of, you know, you have this stage of cancer. You will have this cycle. I'm not going to check at every visit whether you should have the next round or the next round or the next round. You follow this. Maybe you will end up over-treating a few patients, but in, in the benefit of the larger good of the population, some get over-treated, but there's no difference in opinion. There is no ifs and buts between the patient and the doctor in terms of communication. That's one aspect of that. But was maybe you had another point is that, you know, more than that, an individualized patient, like, you know, what kind of gene mutation are you going to have? Uh, what what particular biomarkers you have now with this biomarker will you use this drug or that drug i think that still needs to be worked out thank you thank you dr narayanan and i'll request uh, dr unni krishnan we'll be talking on the clinical applications of octa in am are you ready with your presentation dr unni yes, Um, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Society for the invitation for the talk. Um, down from the, uh, the futuristic things to something very clinically relevant nowadays, how to use OCTA properly. So we just got straight to uh, the topic, and these are the four ways which I think that we will be using OCTA successfully in name the practice. So looking at the OCTA patterns about how uh, the disease you are dealing with. So uh, just to start off, this was a study we did. And we found out various patterns which are regularly uh, regularly described. And one additional pattern which we have, uh, for sake of a better name, we call it the fish net and because we're from Kerala. So essentially, these are the different patterns. We see a very typical lacy pattern, a very compact pattern. You have the Medusa uh, head pattern, which goes all around. You have uh, sea fan patterns where the disease is on one side of the feeder vessel. And this was a fish net pattern. It was larger, larger than the lacy wheel, had mature thick vessels and remained relatively constant throughout the sequence of the diseases. And why was it important? The second part of the study saw how these uh, responded to treatment. And the funny thing is that when you had the fishnet pattern, it did not regress, probably showing that they contained a more mature, thicker vessels than uh, thin fibrillary vessels inside. And uh, amongst the treatment, you can see the area of involvement after injections in the fishnet pattern increased. So I just want to highlight the, pack, the point that each pattern uh, responded differently to treatment with anti -vigil. And this is what would, you would call the beginning of a good response. You see the fibrillary vessels all over the place and you see tangles disappearing with the treatment uh, in a patient. And a poor anatomical response would be, this would indicate a poor anatomical response. You have the presence of anastomotic channels and loops of vessels towards the side of the lesion. And uh, when you call a recurrence, just please remember, it's not the new vessels coming out first. It is the, uh, the enlargement of the existing, pre-existing channels that come out before any new vessel forms. So th this is just an interesting example of a particular uh, lesion. You can see that once a lesion dries up at this particular point, you see a blood vessel. And even though the lesion appears dry throughout the, the blood vessel, the main central core blood vessel still remains. And th that is one important thing that you look for. Uh, the nature of the blood vessel. The second point would be to assess recurrence patterns and modulate your treatment. This is an interesting concept that we should all have inside our minds. So I'm just taking you through a few instances of recurrences. And the recurring theme would be to look at the edge characteristics, that look at the connecting small vessels, connecting all the large vessels at the center. And that would form the reason of uh, looking for a recurrence. So here you see a beautiful, all these small vessels getting interconnected by small edge, an edge anastomosis. And this is how you know that the vessel is uh, recurring. Again, another blood vessel, all this seems fibrillary, but if you look at this particular area, and that corresponds to, you can imagine the fluid corresponding in that area, you can see that you have fine small fibrillary branches, the edge pattern differs, an anastomotic vessel and small vessels run at the edge. Again, this is another sequence of patients 
in which you can see barring the fibrillation you have a new spouting of a small tangle happening beyond temporal to the vessel and that increases in size over time and this is how a recurrence progresses and this is after treatment of the recurrence so this is a slight picture of this of you can see a beautiful anastomotic channel connecting the edges of the lesion in the uh, another the same theme recurring again and again uh, here you can see a fibril the edge with more older vessels over here and a new occurrence happening in the edge so i'm just going to skip this and yeah it's more so how would looking at the OCTA response be interesting? Can you include this into our anti vegf protocols would be a food for thought over here. So if you could incorporate OCTA into the RPRN protocol, that is, before the appearance of SRF, if you could pick out the occurrence of a new vascular fibrillary network, you, had the, uh, you, you have the real power of doing a proper PR and then waiting for SRF referral. Uh, how would you incorporate into a treated extension product, uh, uh, protocol? That is, every visit you do an OCT also, it would explain to you when a breach in the TEA happens. It would also explain to you slightly earlier whether your TEA uh, interval of six weeks or eight weeks is validated. So the next use would be recapitulation. What I want to talk about recapitulation is this is a beneficial part of an, a membrane, which sometimes we do not look at. This was a membrane that happened, a small AC definite pattern, but after some time, there was no signs of activity, but the vessel or the vasculature grew larger in size. Now, this cannot consist or cannot doesn't account to be a recurrence. Basically, what this would be is a beneficial uh, vascular net probably growing underneath, supplying the choreocap uh, RP because of an inherent or diseased choreocapillary. So, this is probably the good effect, a beneficial network which is not causing any activity or protocol. Here, this is another patient in which you can see over time you have a larger and larger network happening but there is no corresponding activity. This is a very large network underneath the uh, subretina supplying in a good way the uh, RP. The last one would be to do a scar assessment. We know how to start treatment. We know how to continue treatment. None of us know how to properly stop treatment is uh, the current scenario we are in. So there are various appearances of, a scar, of the scar uh, called prune, tangle, dead tree and all those things. So eventually what you're looking at is large, long fibrillary vessels without uh, any appearance, but this is something uh, very nice to look at. It's called skeletonization. When you have a fragmented appearance of the of the vessel, and uh, that could be the start. The, the fragmented appearance may disappear after some time, but eventually it keeps on uh, recruiting more and more. It, it becomes skeletonized. You can just imagine this has got uh, small patches where there is uh, the OCTA shows an intact vessel, and uh, uh, like, like a equivalent, like something like a cattle trucking happening over here. To what I say, and this is skeletonization. Uh, so it's like a fragmented vasculature that you see over there. And this is a, uh, just to show you, this is what a scar, and eventually when it goes into reactivity, you can see areas where it, it sprouts out new vessels over there. So how to derive information from an image to help you assess uh, in AMD would be one, uh, look at a vessel, look, look at the corresponding SRF or the nature of the vessel. Try to assume whether it is beneficial, it is recurrent, or it is a stable blood vessel. You need to have a close watch on the number of vessels, the thinness of the vessel, the thickening of the vessels, the edge characteristics, the number of small fibrillary tangles which happen along the vessels. So in summary, OCTA in AMD would help in diagnosis of obviously differentiation in membranes because it could offer insight into how uh, uh, in predicting the response and how a recurrence could happen. Uh, but it could also plan in uh, treating and uh, assessing the, uh, the cessation of treatment. The thoughts of the future would be you were able to fine tune our protocols, anti vegf protocols, by incorporating Octa into uh, subsequent visits and modulating your protocols. It may be it may help you in anticipating vessels whether they're uh, they're regressing, progressing, they're beneficial or they're coincidental. And eventually, reconstruction of Octa protocols will will give you a layer or a depth wise analysis of how uh, vasculature is in a better three D uh, modulation. So just before I finish, I'd like to uh, just uh, just unveiling the logo for our 2023 VRSI. I'd like to invite you all to have a wonderful VRSI at the beach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uni, for those lovely cases that you showed. I had a couple of uh, questions for you. That in your opinion, do you feel that the swept source OCTA, because recent studies have shown that swept source OCTA may be more, you know, superior to SD OCTA, 
as far as you know imaging for uh, is concerned so do you feel uh, that is the case and also for intermediate amd what biomarkers do you think we look for on oct and which would prompt us to you know go towards them? so those are two very uh, different questions the first question about swept source is obviously it's a better te technology but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it gives a better performance on OCTA because uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that. I do not use a swept swept source, so I'm not the best person to comment upon that. So I think I'll leave that to Dr. Sada sometime to come up. Sada, like to help us out. Um, you, we, we do use the swept source OCT quite regularly. I think you get better visualization, but honestly, I think you know for most purposes, uh, spectral domain is just fine. I think that you know you showed some beautiful uh, images. I, I think that what I was impressed by with, uh, with those patterns you so beautifully showed is just how reliable is it or easy is it to make those grading determinations. We tried to do that. We had a, through the MacDill Society Research Committee, we tried to get a group together uh, and try to have people grade the OCTA images, uh, so-called experts, uh, and, we sh and the group struggled to be repeatable in terms of determination, but, uh, but it seems like you were able to do that in a reliable way. That's, that was the challenge for us. Yes, yeah, so one person with a good imagination and too many cooks in the same soup. So. Ani, I have a question for you. So this is, this uh, uh, session is basically on instrument. So are you suggesting that people should switch from OCT, normal SD OCT to an octa? Uh, not do, so not, not from a fluid-based treatment, but a vessel-based treatment? Philosophically, I would say it's a superior thought process. <laughs> okay. You are, you are actually, it's economical. Yeah. <laughs> question is economical. No, see, question. because most, it's, it's question of economy. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't yeah, know. Because, you know, the parameters you listed out, yeah. I was actually going to ask was that we should have an AI eventually to evaluate those parameters and tell us to treat or not to treat. That's an even more so higher level of uh, thought Metaphysics. Process. So, no, I, I, let, let, let me start with this, please. When, all, when most people got the OCT, it was look at the color map, see if there was CMT, and I don't have to know anything else. It was just that. Then after some time, you, people actually started looking at the, at the B scan and seeing that, okay, this was a pattern, this was another pattern. If I realize this pattern, I would treat my patient better. But still, we have people who say, okay, lift the color code, and I will inject or not. So what I'm trying to say is that when we have a tool like OCTA, we're going to learn more and more about it. So why did we, why on earth did we ever start the PRN protocol and define it as 10% of the, uh, a 10% decrease? A 10% decrease is a highly arbitrary value, but it helped us treat the patients better or observe the patients better. You get a tool, you use a tool, you treat your patients better. Now you get a tool, you don't know what to do with it exactly, you're still waiting to use it properly. So I, I was just going to say, we actually did that exercise to try to see if AI analysis of CTA could predict disease activity. We could not find a model, we could not model it. We were, we were unsuccessful. We actually are publishing a paper about a negative result that we couldn't do it. Of course, you never know with AI whether if we have a much bigger sample because it's a big challenge is having huge volumes of OCTA data, which no one has that much OCTA data on neovascularization yet. Uh, but we tried to do other methods to sort of see, is it because we're underpowered in some way? We didn't think so. So we were not able to uncover an OCTA biomarker so far, but it doesn't mean we won't in the future. It doesn't mean but, we won't in the future. So yeah. the basic point is that we just, we, we may not know enough now, that's it. Because he said, these vessels are good for the retina, and these vessels are not good for the retina. How do you differ? I'm going to talk about exactly that topic tomorrow at the oration, so I'm <laughs> going to wait to answer that question until tomorrow. That's pretty good. Thank you, Dr. Ani. And now we have the next uh, talk by Dr. Santosh Gopi. He'll be talking on OCT, OCTA, what's it? Thank you all. Uh, good evening. and. Uh, Sincere thanks to VRSA for this opportunity. I'll be talking about OCT and Okta, what's in store. So uh, most of the uh, presentation, what I kind of compiled is basically the literature search. And uh, we know that most of it is R&D. So it would be great if the esteemed panel and Dr. 
Ada chips in uh, regarding the inputs. So we have come a long way uh, from the uh, in I mean the start of the OCT and then an octa, then uh, various other things from status and to ultra wide field. So the limitations of the present OCT systems, uh, we know that they're expensive and uh, they're really limited to typical clinical settings. They're housed in large uh, tabletop configuration. They need alternating uh, current power and patient uh, position and other things. And if you look at OCT systems, even otherwise, the, the expense of the OCT system that goes on, it's really exponential. So the future would be affordable and portable systems, portable for all patients and faster the acquisition times and the deeper imaging, especially the choroidal imaging and a assistance in such conditions. Uh, to start with simple uh, things like upgrades in acquisition and analysis in uh, Heidelberg, we use Heidelberg. So the speed can be varied uh, whether we are looking at a structural uh, B-scan or we are looking at an octa. And uh, even the analysis, you can integrate uh, third-party uh, applications and third-party instruments to uh, these uh, what do you call the outputs of the OCT uh, observations. So now coming to portable uh, low cost uh, OCT machines, the currently available are these uh, the, from Leica and uh, OptoView as well as Heidelberg. The limitations being these are, uh, there's a steep learning curve uh, artifacts and these are heavy machines which can be overcome by uh, so-called uh, MEM systems wherein it integrates uh, smaller chips. So uh, coming with the newer handheld OCTs, uh, they have portability with extended depth range, uh, MEMS, and even the vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. These help in imaging both from the anterior to the posterior segments without change in additional attachments. So a prototype, prototype SS OCT handheld system was developed by Liu et al., which has an acquisition speed of 350,000 A scans per second. So it's uh, really 10 times greater than the NVISO systems and uh, uh, it's an important consideration uh, to really uh, keep in mind, uh, particularly in the handheld systems. And other handheld uh, portable systems are from Duke University, wherein 55 degree can be used uh, uh, octa imaging for as well as well as structural velocity, whereas 105 degree can be used for the structural velocity. Even in ca cardiac assist cardiac patients and ICU uh, units, you can use these systems, especially octa. Uh, the speed can be varied from 200 to 400 uh, kilohertz and be supportable, but they're subjected to artifacts and uh, they're use really useful in non-dilating pupils. And uh, Duke uh, University, again, uh, they published uh, in Argo 2022, wherein uh, they've done this in uh, the infant as a bedside imaging. So coming to the other entity, which is the spatiotemporal OCT, this, uh, when the light enters the eye to kind of uh, take an image, so uh, there is a defocus and also using numerical uh, various systems and aberration corrections. So you can get a clear cut image and uh, this is equivalent to uh, kind of getting a choroidal imaging. So you can see here, you can see a unfaz imaging and uh, you can see images equivalent to AOCT. So this is how it goes. You can kind of structurally go uh, towards the layers of the choroid from uh, choreo capillaries, uh, uh, halus and satellus. So you can see these, and it is really comparable to Triton OCT also. And coming to changes and uh, upgrades in intraoperative OCT, there is R&D which is happening, which uh, is trying to incorporate intraoperative SS OCT. Uh, this can give rise to real-time volumetric 4D scans, and we can have a uh, good images, the 3D and 4D images when compared to the present 2D images. Since we are moving towards subretinal injections, gene delivery, and sub retinal process, this becomes extremely important. That's a, another entity called multiple uh, reference OCT, and it's a low cost compact configuration. There's a partial mirror that comes in, uh, which uh, is just close to the reference mirror. So it gives us a compact design. And uh, Subhash et al, has, they've already used this with the smartphone-based smartphone inter interface. And this is a, a good one wherein you can see automated OCT or binocular OCT. The OCTs are taken in both eyes simultaneously, the two oculars. It's a tunable SS OCT system. Uh, so it simultaneously uh, kind of uh, gets the scans from anterior uh, eye imaging to the lens, to the uh, retina and the choroid. So there is no need to kind of get additional attachments. So the, these diagnostic functions even include pupillometry, strabismus measurement, and even ocular motility. So looking forward, this really helps in increasing efficiency. It reduces costs and visits, improves quality of eye care. Home-based OCT and MIMO OCT, these are the uh, trends that's uh, really in, uh, happening. 
So even a few of our pharma people are trying to get this into the system. So this is a very small OCT. You get a very good image uh, with this, uh, but the resolution is less, especially for elderly patient for uh, home-based monitoring. Wide field octa, again, there are new strategies in uh, DR. There are classifications that have come up. A few of the groups have published where they say that no DR, subclinical, NPDR, which uh, goes up to moderate NPDR, severe or proliferative DR, depends on the uh, IRMAS and uh, uh, venous bleeding and all. So uh, then again, 3D octa. You can, uh, this is through Cirrus 9000. You can see the same with uh, even AMD patients in the CNMUM complex. Uh, this has been uh, long published, 2017, 2018. Uh, the, the VISTA analysis wherein uh, the SSOCT system, uh, the interscan times can be varied to get the flow in the blood vessels. You can kind of measure which blood vessels uh, have faster flow, which have a slower flow. So still it hasn't come into a commercial uh, system. So this is one thing which can change to some extent of the octa interpretation. The same with uh, even, even, even in DR also, you can see these changes. Polarization sensitive OCT again, only prototype so far. And then again, 2015, 16, 17. So it uses light, uh, light tissue interaction and polarization state, especially the birefringence and depolarization, which is limited to the RP and melanin. So this is a, a prototype what we have developed at Naran Netralia in collaboration of uh, Medical University of Vienna. So these are the images what we get. So when you see a patient with this with 612 vision, so there, there are some changes in the outer retina here, but when you look at a polarization sensitive changes at the axis orientation, you can see the changes happening in the center. So these are no, normal patients, targets and retentis pigmentosa and other atypical RP changes. So finally, a word on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is a big thing that we look up to, uh, quite complex and can't be covered in this talk. So various algorithms or techniques are being developed, but the limitation is insufficient features with lower accuracies and it's pretty expensive. Uh, the build it at last may not really represent the exact population what we are looking at and the selection of the best layers and images are still a research problem. So to conclude, feature of Okta and OCT, we are going towards portability, affordability, newer hardware and supporting software systems and the role of uh, artificial intelligence. Thanks so much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. That was a very illustrative uh presentation on some of the newer things coming up Thanks. and uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Sada whether he feels that the AI coming in and some deep learning involved in the interpretation of wide field imaging and OCTA feels that we might come across a Tesla moment or a you know like a which, which could be a problem in the future for us or maybe like a Da Vinci moment where the robo goes crazy. So do you think that we can see that coming in the so I, I think it looks pretty promising that, that AI will roll out as some type of physician assist tool. I'm not as worried about us being <clears throat> replaced. Uh, one of the challenge, there, there's a few challenges in the AI space. One is regulatory approval for a diagnostic is, uh, is a high bar still. And screening, there, obviously there are many um, screening systems, uh, which screening is basically a binary decision, yes or no. Uh, those um, have been able to get uh, cleared by regulatory authorities, but a true diagnostic system is more complicated, and so there'll be the challenge of regulatory approval, but the biggest challenge actually, quite frankly, in AI right now is who's going to pay for it? Uh, and, uh, and so everyone wants to have the benefit of AI, again, maybe having a physician assist, but will you be willing to pay extra money uh, for that assistance? That remains to be seen. So I think there are many challenges, actually, so I don't think anybody needs to worry about their job uh, in the immediate future. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are running short of time, so we'll move on to the next talk. And it's by Dr. Manish Nakwal, and he'll be talking on multimodal white field imaging using SLO. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, I'll be speaking to you about this SLO-based multimodal imaging. And uh, SLO-based imaging is something that I've been using for the last 20 years, originally with uh, Spectralis. Uh, uh, from the inception that it came through and the beauty of these systems is that you can see the same uh, image, same uh, diagnostic condition with different sets of uh, multimodal imaging tools like OCTs, FAs, ICDs. Based on diagnosis, you could go on and see uh, different aspects of them. The videos are not running. Anyway, so this is the OCT of the same uh, subhyloid hemorrhage that you saw 
and you can do an FA, you can do an ICG if you like, and see different aspects of it. This was a recent patient who came to us with a picture like this, an RP rip as being treated, and you can see uh, how well it is seen on the OCT. The arrow points out where exactly the rip takes place, that patient, and, and of course you can chart it out using these parameters on the FA and the ICG to look at uh, the exact location of the rips in these cases. And of course, white field imaging allows you to see uh, as peripheral as possible to look at new vessels and leaks in the periphery so that you can treat these patients effectively in a sexual manner. This is a patient who came to us with an extensively done PRP with choroidals and uh, this is how uh, the FA looks like in that patient. So again, a patient with peripheral ischemia, you can see sclerosed vessels and uh, the white field images give you the full extent of uh, how uh, well the CNP areas are noted in these. And then of course the ICG capabilities with uh, these systems and that too wide field, look at the clarity of these systems. So this is all using the Mirante technology, the SLO based technology, which earlier Spectralis came and now it's the Mirante, which gives you these really wide field montages that you can do with these uh, images. This is very useful for uh, areas like choroiditis, uh, uveitis, posterior uveitis, where you can really chart out uh, where the active lesions are, especially in the peripheral part, which sometimes you can miss. And of course, the posterior pole is seen quite well uh, using uh, the ultra wide field uh, modality. You can see the peripheral extent of the lesion in these ischemic, uh, in these uh, inflammatory lesions. And here you see the ICG where the active areas are there multifocally in, uh, spread out. And then you do the wide field mode to look at the FA where uh, the leak is happening. And this tells you. The activity of the condition and as you treat you can follow them up uh, using these modalities. The other areas of activity that you can deal by multimodal imaging is also to look by octa. I mean you saw the neovascular capabilities but also for uh, these posterior uveitis entities you can see active lesions as uh, these, these hypofluorescent dots that you the areas that you see just like you see in ICG the same thing you tend to see on octa as well and these are uh, again uh, using these modalities to look at an active lesion and as you treat this lesion you see from the top to the bottom you will see that the lesions are uh, kind of coalescing itself and then dispersing so the activity goes down as you treat the patient with uh, high dose steroids and follow them up over a period of time. And uh, this is the best disease uh, uh, you can see the autofluorescence uh, and of course the Mirante allows you to do this retro mode technology which is a very lunar like crater like image. Uh, it picks up any excrescences or elevations in the RP uh, layer and gives you these uh, interesting images apart from doing the regular uh, OCTs that you see. The brucens are picked up very well uh, using the, the retro mode which otherwise you may see uh, uh, not so well on the regular color images but when you look at these SLO based color images they are picked up very well. Now this is a tenophobia uh, presumed toxicity which is seen so well uh, using this modality and you can see how well the autofluorescence uh, picks up uh, these images apart from the OCTs changes that you see as excrescences uh, in these layers. The other biggest advantage we also uh, talked about it in the afternoon today in the imaging session is the ability of these uh, SLO based uh, laser based technology to go through smaller pupils and uh, we've tried it in a lot of variety of pupils uh, you can see the size of pupil here also slightly denser medias, uh, uveitic cases. This is a case where there is an exudative RD behind which otherwise was extremely difficult to see with the slight cataractus synechia based pupil and you can see it quite well uh, uh, using uh, the uh, Mirante. This is a patient again we were having difficulty seeing the posterior pole and you can see that there is an activity uh, taking place. You do a decent OCT, a decent color picture and you can document and treat the patient effectively which otherwise you struggle to treat. You sometimes can't find the cause of uh, loss of vision in these eyes. This is again another patient uh, doing a similar change and a cystoid macular edema in a small pupil uveitic patient. So to follow up these patients to see whether the edema has come down or not and the pupil it doesn't allow you to see, uh, these uh, SLO based uh, machines can go through them quite effectively. Also keratoprosthesis, uh, uh, we, we had a patient some time back who had come with a decrease in vision uh, with keratoprosthesis and uh, we were struggling to see the fundus but we could get these images uh, quite reasonably well with the 
uh, Mirante, and you can see uh, the cystoid edema, which was there, and then gave a Kenakot to the patient and it improved. And of course, we also discussed in the afternoon about this uh, uh, multicolor and uh, true color, and I'm not sure uh, how these are defined, and there was some lack of clarity on that part. But uh, these are spectralis images that you see with this greenish hue uh, that come in. These are optus images again with this whole greenish hue that uh, are seen in the eyelashes. And uh, the Mirante uses these four colors, and I, I think they come as close to the natural color as a pseudo color can get uh, compared to those the greenish hue that comes in those images. And you get uh, these are the colors that you see, and they are as natural as they can be. Uh, which you are used to seeing uh, with a white light face. Of course, they are not white light uh, standard pictures, but as close that you can get to uh, recreate them and then uh, do all sorts of multimodal imaging. I also want to show your patient simply uh, color pictures of a patient who comes with less vision. And of course, when you see them closely, you will see uh, more things. But you look at comparison of an SLO image versus a color image on a standard uh, uh, fundus camera. And you instantly know you're dealing with a dystrophy of sorts. Uh, there is a change which is which is more difficult for us to pick up on a on a standard image. This is the both the eyes of the same patient. And of course, if you do autofluorescence, you pick it up right away. But these color images are far superior to uh, what you are used to seeing. With uh, they give you much more information and allow you the multimodal capabilities that are there. And these are the quality of the colors that can come uh, with this. Optic nerve fits. Uh, you can see the exact extent and the autofluorescent collection of the fluid. The slightest uh, uh, recurrence of a membrane which is coming up, a secondary membrane between two scars of the toxoplasma lesion and uh, FAF picking up uh, those lesions. And of course, uh, a central as well as the, uh, the, the full field image of pictures where you need to see central as well as peripheral. It will give you different information uh, in, in these cases. So these are some of the different types of images that you can get. And lastly, I think uh, one of my fellows presented today uh, the regmatogenous retinal detachments that uh, we've been doing the study with the, uh, the charting uh, and comparing. We masked uh, both the charting as well as the uh, photos taken on the Mirante, and we could find almost similar results. Uh, uh, and, and the time taken on the charting is much more as compared to that. Of course, it cannot uh, be there for every kind of case, but uh, to a large extent, it helps us. Uh, document it so well that it almost uh, acts as a chart for you to take a decision of what you want to do to these patients or what you plan as surgery in these patients. So these are the kind of, this is an oil-filled eye with a buckle uh, done post-operatively and as close to a natural image as possible. So these are all the different uh, ways that you can use uh, multimodally this whole technology. And I feel what the images I see, and I've seen the involvement of an SLO from the earliest HRA Heidelbergs that we used to have in early 2000 to now. And uh, these are just brilliant as compared to what we are used to with the white light based images. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manish, for the beautiful images. And I had a couple of questions for you. That the wide angle images that you showed, are these steered images that you showed? Sorry? The ones, uh, the post op and steered images? Steered? Steered. The, the you know ask the patient to look in one direction and so some of them are 160 degrees and some the uh, ultra wide fields are montages of course yeah where you ask the patient to look up and down and then we do it. and you don't get the eyelash uh, artifact not with opto with this uh, uh, not like the what you see with optos in this sometimes you uh, if a patient is uncooperative i think you pick, pick a earbud and lift the lid a bit to do that but we never really get uh, the typical eyelashes that you see with optos uh, Amazing picture. So I had another question that you know, the retro mode is which fascinates me a lot. So have you used it in DSCR or you know any such diseases where you know there are recent publications in which they have found it very useful and in fact superior to FAF? You know, well, uh, like it CSR. picks up uh, small excrescences very well. Drusens and uh, drusenoid lesions uh, picks up are picked up very well on it. CSCR, of course, you can see uh, certain changes there, but it's not consistent across the board. I don't think uh, you can pick up a site of leak or something on that is not something that happens that easily on, on the retro mode. We've tried that a lot in the past. When uh, I think uh, the NIDEC had a retro mode 
uh, machine separately. To this we used to use that and we would try to do a lot of uh, CSR on that, but we could not get consistency for that. But it's brilliant for Drusens and the subtle excrescences, uh, best disease, all these things is better. Also, I think uh, Vas has, uh, uh, I remember once talking about peripheral retromode uh, Drusens in findings in some of the cases you had talked about, I remember uh, using the retromode. Yeah, I, I, th I think the retro is very nice for highlighting subtle abnormalities that you might have otherwise missed. Uh, uh, the case you're referring to, Anish is a, was a patient who had Stargardt's, uh, actually, and they had a flex around the area of atrophy, but then they had these peripheral drusenoid-like lesions, yes. Yes. which the retro mode uh, highlighted. But yeah, I think the metro retro mode is, is nice It's because it's infrared light. It's very comfortable for the patient. You can highlight areas like atrophy, and the like if you're trying to quantify, track that. So I think there are some applications of uh, retro. I think it's an exciting new technology. Dr. Ajay, would you like to add something? And I would also request the last speaker, Dr. Kushma, to please podium. Just two points, which I think Manish, one great advantage is the eyelashes. And the advantage comes from the point that you have an access to the patient's eye and introduce a, a earbud and lift. But so this is a session for instrumentation, so I just wanted to bring out those. While in other machines, uh, you may not have an access to the lids, and Mirante permits yeah. you an access to them. Second thing is about, I think we have got to get used to, because we have a Mirante, got to get used to the multicolor image. So when you get a multicolor image, it gives you an option of going to the blue channel, green channel, and the red channel. So then you look at each of them, and then again you look back at the multicolor, it gives you a lot more. That's what, it's a learning process. I think the, the basic advantage is the whole flexibility across the board where you have the patient sitting on one particular machine and then you, based on the diagnosis or what you need, you could just play around with so many different ways of looking at the same lesion and that may give you ideas like how Uni was talking of the fishnet on the OCTA. You look and find patterns which would come up. The only problem with this, uh, with the with the SLO based images, is when you have uh, somebody else working in the clinic and they'll say, "Oh my God, this doesn't tell me about the glaucoma findings so well. This is a useless machine." So that is what you have to answer to look at it because what we are used to is imaging by white light. What we have to get used to is imaging by wavelength. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Now uh, we have Dr. Sushma Jayanam. She'll be talking on usefulness of ultrawide under photography for documentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, in the next five minutes, I'll be briefing on our study on usefulness of ultrawide field color fundus imaging in uh, retinopathy of prematurity. So we all know that uh, there are already existing popular uh, uh, pediatric fundus cameras like uh, RedCam and Forus, and its efficacy and uh, safety has already been, uh, been uh, proven. So uh, what is the need for an ultra-wide field photography in ROP? Uh, so the main advantage of, uh, of optos or ultra-wide uh, fundus imaging in ROP, apart from its 200-degree uh, uh, wide field in a single frame, uh, is that uh, it's uh, maintenance of resolution after magnification. Uh, it's mainly because of its uh, source of uh, uh, light, which has been uh, SLO, where uh, the other two cameras has either LED or halogen-based uh, light source. So uh, these finer details, which is happening in the periphery, becomes uh, more important in uh, recent times where uh, anti bgf has become the mainstream of treatment in ROP. So, uh, yeah, there are a few pilot studies which has already been established uh, uh, the usefulness of uh, this ultra-wide field fundus imaging in uh, ROP. So the purpose of our study was to establish its utility in a larger data set uh, in a tertiary eye care busy OPD. So the study was retrospective in nature and it was conducted in LBP Hyderabad. And the criteria was all the, uh, the all the babies who had our, uh, the ultra wide field color fundus imaging done in both the eye were included within the uh, the time period, and who, with uh, with the images with poor media uh, poor uh, visibility media opacity or lack of parent consent to take the image were excluded. 
So uh, the methodology uh, included, uh, it was a retrospective. So the initially a clinician uh, uh, had uh, done a binocular indirect examination uh, in detail. And then the uh, baby was directed to take the images to document the findings which was noted down. And the images uh, was taken in a modified uh, flying baby position where the body of the, the chest of the ba uh, baby is supported by the arm of the uh, uh, the forearm of the uh, technicians and uh, after wrapping the baby well and uh, uh, putting a topical anesthetist and an anesthesia and uh, placing an eye speculum and the pupillary alignment was achieved by uh, moving the head. So uh, both the uh, BIO findings and the images were uh, noted down into uh, from the EMR and uh, BIO findings and the corresponding findings seen in uh, the uh, color funders imaging were analyzed uh, for the concordance by an ROP specialist. So uh, also the specific findings apart from the stage zone plus and AROP, the finer vascular details were also uh, uh, noted down which was mentioned in BIO and uh, treatment, in, treatment intervention and image artifacts were also noted down. So. Uh, Coming to the descriptive studies, our sample size included uh, 187 successful images out of 247 uh, images which was attempted. Uh, these were the descriptive uh, mean ages and uh, among, among the finer vascular de uh, details which was analyzed, uh, the fine new vessels and the fine vessel looping was uh, seen most commonly. And uh, 22 images were discordant with the findings of uh, binocular findings. So all the images uh, which had missed findings were because of the artifacts which was blocking the corresponding uh, details. So most commonly missed findings were in zone 2 anterior and uh, but the posterior disease obviously was not missed and the treatment strategy was always and only based on the uh, BIO findings. And yes, none developed any red flag signs during uh, either uh, binocular examination or uh, indirect examination or during or after the Im imaging. So uh, the usefulness in our study while using uh, ultra wide field imaging in ROP was basically it was quick and it did not need another additional equipment or uh, requirements like another uh, uh, or a trolley or a bed. It was just done in a, a normal optos which was being used for adult imaging. And it helped in quick good parent counseling to counsel them then and there and also uh, to take us a second expert opinion and it also served us uh, well to follow up the disease and uh, especially to pick up the uh, skip areas in post treatment in a single uh, frame without having to uh, go through the monta montage images and it, 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 it's actually an excellent tool uh, when we have to study the finer details which is happening in the periphery because it doesn't hamper the resolution so uh, uh, this could be a great help uh, for the uh, to know the course of the disease uh, after treatment. So yes, uh, the artifacts mainly which included, uh, which was blocking the findings were aperture artifact and the nose artifact which was actually in the superior temporal quadrant. And uh, yeah, eyelids and eyelashes were blocking the horizontal quadrants. So uh, our study was supposed to, was the largest uh, uh, study which proved the uh, usefulness and safety uh, of the uh, ultra wide field color fundus imaging in ROP and yes uh, the study was retrospective that was a limitation and the machine limitation is that it has got the false color hue and the uh, non portability and the day it becomes uh, portable I think uh, it's going to be a game changer in uh, not only in telescreening in ROP but as such in any peripheral vascular disease telescreening. So to conclude with uh, ultra wide field color fundus imaging yeah, which is a non-contact and quick method uh, can be a, a excellent tool for documentation you know is a busy opd in a tertiary care setup thank you thank you dr sushma that was a brilliant idea and uh, excellent images i had a practical doubt uh, when you apply topical anesthetic put a speculum the cornea is going to dry up very quickly so how quickly did your yeah uh, once you managed to take the images per eye so I did not mention the time or uh, uh, taken to just click. It it hardly takes uh, three to four seconds once the pupillary alignment is achieved. Just a click uh, will be done with the imaging. Yeah. To while achieving the alignment, we might have to put the uh, either a refresh tears or a, a lubricants or, or, or two three times. But once the alignment is achieved, it hardly takes one or two seconds to click the image. Thank you, Dr. Sushma. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Shushma, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. You know, most of the screening for the ROP is NICU beds and ICU beds. And all these examinations you did in Edupasad. So if I'm going to a NICU, for me, the best option available is an indirect ophthalmoscopy photography or a forus or a rectum. But the baby has to be healthy enough to be able to be brought to the institute to, uh, to do that. So yes, do you sir. think so, that's important? Yes, those babies who came to our IC, I mean, our stable, OPDs yeah. were stable and discharged from the ICUs. So uh, that is the main problem with this ultra wide field is that it's not portable. So we can't take them uh, to the uh, ICUs or the pediatric unit. So yeah, that is what is required at this. Uh, you point. said 176 out of 247. So 187 out of yeah, 247. Uh, so there was 24% patients who were not able to do. Was it because uh, there was some problem in alignment or? Uh, it's basically uh, uh, because either the uh, technician was not able to uh, achieve the uh, good images, so the exclusion criteria was, I mean, inclusion criteria was not met where the image was completely blurred or the pupil was not dilated or it was a APROP which was uh, uh, not letting the pupil dilate. So those are the images which was tried but it was not successfully done. Thank you. Just a last question that 4 out of 187 patients you could not diagnose just based on ultra wide field imaging. No, 22, 22 yeah. of them were discordant uh, findings because and, of. And 4 out of 187, I believe, were not to be treated if you were using only yes, ultra yes, wide field. Yes. Would that be Treatment a warranted. Uh, yes. this so is, would yes. that be a concern? You would miss out on this. Yes, uh, that is why the, basically the peripheral uh, blockage which happens due to the artifact may miss out those stage 4 and the elevated uh, uh, ridges in that particular quadrant. So that might lead to the, so obviously BIO is always the gold standard. Even the medical legal, you know, yes, kind very of fall out, I think we have to be aware of that. Any other points uh, the wise council has to add? Uh, so we have been trying to use us into our ROPs. So we had some patients who had obvious extreme peripheral retinal hemorrhages. They had a thrombocytopenia. So it's all technician based. The technician is good to do run up for us and take the image. The technician is not good. You would rather for the medical legal purpose do a good interview. That's what I have personally. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you. So I have a, I think we've come to the end of the session. I have a, a housekeeping announcement to make that the uh, inauguration and followed by the cultural meeting will be in the lawns outside 6 p.m. onwards. So 6 p.m. onward is the inauguration followed by the cultural evening, the lawns outside.